Hello everyone, it's Crash Knife Fight, and after putting together my last video and pondering the elements that make a good video game, I started thinking about the evolution of gaming and some of the epical moments in hardware and technology that forever changed the landscape of the industry. Now, I'm not a professional game critic, nor a video game journalist. I'm a trained historian, but my field of study does not include popular culture. What I believe makes me credible to speak about this subject is the fact that I am a first-generation gamer. I'm not going to say how old I am, but I remember when my parents brought home a new Atari 2600, and I have fond memories of sitting in the living room with the family playing Asteroids and Breakout. I have owned at least one console at some point from every generation of home consoles and done a fair share of PC gaming along the way. None of that makes me an expert, but I have the privilege of memory and hindsight. I can look back through a wide lens over the last four decades and recall the trends and patterns that developed and think about the moments that created the longest lasting impact on the gaming world. Now, there is no revelation in stating that the internet has had a huge effect on gaming for some time now. As a matter of fact, we don't think about how we are all connected through our smartphones, consoles, computers, TVs, and other devices. For some of you watching this, you probably don't remember a time when you were not connected to the web at least by one device, if not several. Moreover, the relationship between the internet and video games has grown in such a steady and organic way that we rarely take a step back to either appreciate it or apply some due criticism. And that is basically what I want to do here, because the internet has brought a fair share of problems to gaming and gaming culture. While some of the problems have been around since the days of Doom LAN parties in the 90s, others have become more prominent in the last decade or a little more due to the online capabilities of consoles. Let me add here that there is more good than bad when it comes to online capabilities. The multitude of advantages are numerous, but it's worth taking a moment to see how the internet has fostered bad habits with game developers and publishers and negatively affected the larger gaming community. So let's start with one of the biggest issues. The growing problem of publishers releasing incomplete games. Incomplete games come in two main forms. The first are games in which game companies promise follow-on downloadable content, but the game content at launch is shallow and lacks replay value. The second are games that are tremendously buggy and glitched out. Sometimes, these games fall into both categories. Regardless, in both cases, companies are using the ability to push out updates, patches, and new content to rush out unpolished games or build players out of money. The idea of DLC is great. It extends the life and replay value of a game and can keep players interested in a title for years past its launch. Good DLC for good games is worth paying for. A few good examples are the Frozen Wilds expansion that followed the PS4 title Horizon Zero Dawn, and the two expansions for The Witcher 3. The opposite, however, is paying for DLC that completes a game rather than expanding and enhancing it. A recent example was Star Wars Battlefront from 2015. EA and DICE's first outing in the Battlefront series was visually stunning and offered Star Wars fans and gamers a truly immersive and authentic Star Wars experience. But the title at launch only included four locations and a handful of game modes, and nothing to speak of in the way of offline single-player content. The lion's share of the rest of the content was available for purchase through four expansions. The expansions added some very good content and included some fan-favorite locations and new heroes and villains. But each expansion cost $15 individually at the time of their launch, or a player could purchase a season pass for $50 and receive all of the DLC seasons and save a whopping $10. This meant that at best, to get all of the content for the game when it first became available, a player was forking over $110. Other franchises and game companies have used this tactic. The Destiny titles received criticism for a lack of content at launch, and Bungie and Activision fumbled their way through several expansions before giving players quality content. Although relative to Battlefront 2015, those titles at launch at least included a single-player campaign and built a social community around their game. Like I said earlier, good content for a good game is worth paying for, but the fact that the majority of gamers are now online allows developers to either withhold content and build players for more money, or simply finish the game post-launch. Either way, this is getting into some ethically murky territory. The other side of incomplete games, buggy and glitchy titles that frustrate players, is an issue that predates online capabilities. 
Sometimes these bugs are just funny and actually wind up endearing players to the game. Other times, these bugs prevent players from advancing in the game, cause it to crash, create serious unbalancing issues in online multiplayer games. Look, even the best, most well-polished titles can suffer from a bug or two. Games now are incredibly complicated. They have a lot of moving parts, a lot of people working on them, and online play adds another layer of complexity. Sometimes a bug can slip through even the most strenuously play-tested games. And that's the great thing about patches and updates. Developers can fix glitches post-launch and improve the game experience. Nevertheless, this is becoming a crutch for game companies. Publishers and developers will never admit this, but they are releasing defective games, knowing that they can fix it post-launch. This is quite alarming, taking into consideration how long some of these titles are in development. Probably the worst or best example of this, depending on how you look at it, is EA and BioWare's Anthem. If you would like to get some insight into the nightmare behind this game's development and production, I have a link to an article by Jason Schreier on Kotaku.com in the comments below. It's a pretty lengthy article, but once you read it, you will come away scratching your head wondering why this game was not delayed or even scrapped. A big part of the answer is that EA and BioWare knew in the back of their minds everything could be fixed post-launch. Some games have actually weathered the storm, and through patches and updates, game companies have at least partially redeemed themselves by fixing or altering games. Once again, Star Wars Battlefront 2 comes to mind, as DICE and EA work diligently to make amends for the Loot Crate fiasco at launch and add a true progression system. No Man's Sky by Hello Games is another title that did not deliver as advertised at launch. The title was missing promised features, and many critics found the game to be boring. Hello Games continued to work on the title of the game and slightly improved the company's reputation. The problem here, however, is this shouldn't happen at all. Prior to the last 15 years or less, if a game company made an incomplete game for a console, then they just made an incomplete game, and if they were lucky, they might get a chance with another title to improve their reputation and recover their losses. Now, this may be hindsight, but it seemed to happen less often in the older generation of consoles than it does today particularly with the bigger companies and bigger titles. Alright, so I want to move on here to where another problem originates, and it's created by both game companies and players. The never-ending suck hole of online information and social media. The internet has become the greatest marketing tool in the history of man. Companies selling everything from herbal Viagra to luxury automobiles use the internet and social media to shield their products. And why wouldn't they? For game companies, it's a no-brainer, since they are already catering to at least a moderately tech-savvy consumer. But the marketing blitz we see now across social media and the internet in general starts years ahead of a title's release. Think about some of the big titles that were released over the past few months. For me, Days Gone and Anthem come to mind. Now think about how long you have been hearing about those games. EA officially announced Anthem in June 2017 at E3 with the trailer and gameplay footage, 18 months ahead of its release. We hadn't even seen a trailer for Avengers Infinity War at that point. Days Gone was announced in 2016 at, 8, at E3. In the interim of a game's announcement and its release, we are inundated with constant updates via social media, game footage, interviews with game designers, behind-the-scenes coverage, leaked information, and on and on and on. The problem is, it often backfires for a company. Sure, these game companies must build up the hype and they need to keep people interested, but it is unnecessary to start so early in a game's production. Starting so early puts pressure on the game devs to avoid a delay. And worse, all the hype for so long keeps building expectations. And if these games do not deliver 100%, they get destroyed by critics. Days Gone is a perfect example. I haven't played the game yet, but from what I have read and seen, it's a decent game, but rather mediocre. Nevertheless, all of the hype has certainly subconsciously influenced everyone who has reviewed it, and probably in a negative way. Which leads me to the other side of the social media problem, the hive of scum and villainy existing on nearly every social media platform available. Game companies are pretty good by themselves at crushing or raising expectations about their titles. But the mass of YouTubers, Redditors, and all the rest are fantastic at helping them along, and worse yet, turning gaming culture into a toxic cesspool. 
I could dive really deep into this problem, but to keep this brief, I'll touch on one of the bigger issues, which is the mass of unofficial information we have spewing forth from every corner of the internet. Everyone is looking for more views, likes, and upvotes, and there are a lot of people willing to take advantage of the naive to get them. When it comes to news about games or leaks about games, most social media types are not privy to any more information than the rest of us. They simply synthesize what is already out there from official sources and some less reliable leaks, and then create clickbait. One recent snafu that I found hilarious was the Droidica fiasco from Star Wars Battlefront 2. You might recall back in August, EA released an image of the first new clone skins. In the bottom right of the image, a blurry form of a Droidica is present. That's all it took for everyone to go haywire, and very shortly the internet was filled with Droidicas leaked, Droidicas coming to Battlefront 2, EA teases Droidicas. Go check it out, a lot of this stuff is still out there. Confusion ensued at EA, and after several cryptic responses, their community manager Ben Walk finally asserted that Droidicas were not coming to BF2. But it gets better. A fair number of those same individuals that jumped the gun and started pumping up everyone about droidicas started acting like EA had somehow betrayed them, like they had dangled a carrot out in front of them before yanking it away. Granted, EA handled this issue about as poorly as a company could, but they really had done nothing wrong, and I love seeing all of those guys pout over it. Unfortunately, none of them lost any credibility. Look. It's fun to speculate about the future of a game. I do it myself. But there's a line a lot of people cross, and it's all for the sake of getting more clicks under their belt. One final issue I would like to address here is not a full-blown problem yet, but a trend in the gaming world that concerns me. We are seeing game companies put a lot of emphasis on online and multiplayer experiences in their games. I like playing online, but I also like a variety of games where online capabilities are not necessary. There are several reasons that game companies are headed in this direction. First off, you have the games as a service model where companies continue to make revenue off the same game after its initial launch. Second, games based around an online component are cheaper to create. Lastly, it's monkey see, monkey do. Like a company sees the success of games like Player Unknown, Battlegrounds, or Fortnite, and they try to duplicate that success. The ones that really make me scratch my head, however, are companies that feel they need to overhaul their most popular franchises to bring in an online experience. The disaster that is Fallout 76 should serve as a warning to other developers. Creating a multiplayer experience for that franchise was unnecessary and the game has been riddled with problems. And it's not just that, it's the way some companies handle squad-based modes. I can jump into a game like Battlefront, Call of Duty, or Battlefield, get connected to a lobby, and jump right into a game. But in the loot shooter world, franchises like Destiny and The Division, they have segments of the game that require a squad. And for some of us, it's very difficult to find four to eight other friends at a specific time of day to complete raids or venture into the dark zone. It's really frustrating because it feels like you're getting left behind. Which reminds me, if anybody would like to join my Division 2 clan on PS4, look for Crash Core. It's open invitation, and right now, it's only me. So, like I said at the start, the benefits outweigh the drawbacks when it comes to the internet and gaming. But we should stop every once in a while to assess the state of things. Look at something through a wider lens and see where we are headed. Well, I believe I'm done ranting for now. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to like and subscribe, and I'll be back soon.